Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're here in uh, Tucson with uh, decorated cardiologist, uh, wine enthusiast, uh, and um, uh, the founder of the Renault Society, and a sponsor of the Jake Feinberg Show, a beautiful cat. Ted Goldfinger, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. Happy to be here. Dr. Ted, can you, t I mean, can you talk a little bit about the transition, the Zin transition? For so long, it was known as a a cheap bottle of, of beach wine, and then it started to change. And I wanted you to take us through the the Zin evolution transition. Yeah, Zinfandel is a very interesting grape uh, and a very interesting wine, Jake. Uh, I know that you've had an interest in it recently. You've had a chance to meet with some of the quintessential uh, Zinfandel producers in Napa Valley. So, yeah, Zinfandel has its history dating back several decades, uh, probably made famous by Sutter Holm, and they made this white Zinfandel. Yeah, white Zinfandel is basically Zinfandel grape, which is a very dark red grape, produces a very dark, deep red wine, mm. that they um, sort of took off the skins early and then mixed it with Zinfandel juice that wasn't fermented. So you have about oh, 80, 90% uh, 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 wine that's sort of not allowed to absorb all the color, so it's a pale uh, red color, like a pink color, and then mixed with some juice to give it some sweetness and some real interesting flavors of the Zinfandel grape. It's uh, easy to make, uh, it was cheap and really po really popular, so it really brought, brought Zinfandel on the, uh, on the market. Uh, however, some <laughs> serious producers really yeah. figured out this was, uh, Zinfandel is a really interesting grape. It's an American grape, you know, at least the Americans, uh, American producers have, um, have uh, adopted it. it. It has its roots elsewhere, uh, Croatia primarily. Uh, Eastern Europe. You yeah, mostly actually Croatia. Croatia has and there's some in uh, in, uh, in in southern Italy. The Italian variety is called Primitivo. The uh, the the true um, genetic precursor to American Zinfandel is actually from Croatia, and I can't pronounce the uh, what, the, what the grape is, but it, but it is interesting. And um, so some uh, uh, really bright American producers started to produce red Zinfandel the way it should be produced here in the, the United States. And it has uh, really become very, very popular. It's um, it's modestly priced. You know, some Zinfandels can cost a fair penny per per, per bottle. Uh, but it, compared to some of the Napa Valley Cabernets or Merlots or some other popular varietals, it's relatively cost effective, and it's a beautiful wine. You know, I have patients that uh, we talk about the health benefits of wine often. And uh, they ask me, uh, you know, well, I really don't drink wine. I, I've never, never really liked wine. I'm right. really concerned. Right. You know, it eats my mouth up. It's dry. Right. And so on and so forth. What can I drink? What can I start with that is a wine potentially uh, that I can enjoy? And I usually make two recommendations. One is Pinot Noir because it's a light, it's a lighter, fruitier wine in general. Still dry. There's, there's not a lot of sugar in these wines. And the second is Zinfandel and because Zinfandel has a natural naturally spicy flavor. The characteristic flavor of a, of a good American red Zinfandel is one of a intense black pepper. Wow. So it's a yeah, real it's peppery, and I'm sure you've experienced, yeah, yeah, you're right, sure you've experienced yeah. it. It's a real peppery wine. It's got a lot of flavors. It's not just that those tannins eating up your mouth that you have to put a piece of fatty meat in your mouth to sort of balance it. Zinfandel is one of those grapes that has a lot of natural spice, flavor, fruit, um, and uh, can be enjoyed both with food or independently. You know, one of the problems with Zinfandel potentially is that it is such a robust grape. Uh, it really ferments to high, relatively high alcohol content. So that's probably the only criticism of the grape, but I think Zinfandel is a fantastic uh, uh, glass of wine to drink every day. You know, Dr. Ted, um, you know, when I interviewed, um, let's see, his name is just Dr. Ardell. Uh, from from Australia, the, the debate there, which I don't think is very different from here, is abstinence only versus, uh, well, there's really no in between. The idea of trying to talk to them about moderate red wine, what is moderate versus just abstinence? What is the debate going on in this country? How does the Renault Society want to further that debate and educate people? Yeah, so the debate and the political strife that's going on is the same here as it is in Australia and even more so in Europe. Uh, there is a strong lobby against all alcohol consumption and um, and I think that does a disservice, personally, I think it does a disservice to uh, 
to our communities because Can you talk about the, who's lobbying that exactly? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, there are there are groups out there, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, sure. I mean, all the all these uh, groups that that uh, that uh, focus on alcoholism. Look, alcoholism is bad. Uh, alcohol excess, all alcohol excess, beer, wine, spirits, whatever, taken inappropriately, irresponsibly, is is disastrous. Has disastrous consequences. Nobody denies that. However, in moderation responsibly, without involving automobiles or so on and so forth, in the, in the, um, in the comforts of your own home, with family, friends, at the, at the dinner table, a modest amount of wine at, at, in the evenings with, with, with a meal, has been shown over and over again. It's one of the most consistent uh, findings in medicine, over and over again to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular events, and cardiac death. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, the, the separation between irresponsible versus responsible wine consumption is, a, of course, a fine line. And, you know, people often ask, you know, well, what, what do you consider irresponsible excessive drinking? Right. My answer is always, if you drink more than I do, it's irresponsible. I, I mean, you so, always, this, I mean <laughs> but, but the idea is that, does the Renault Society want to talk to those lobbying groups that are yeah. opposed to it and, and sort of try to, because they are adamant about abstinence. It is a slippery slope, but, sure. but I mean, how do you actually bridge that gap? Sure. Well, I'm glad you interviewed uh, Dr. Arnold because he, uh, he, he looks at this from both, both sides. He is a cardiologist, a very well-respected cardiologist at the University of Adelaide in uh, South Australia, and he's also a wine producer. He has a, uh, pr he has a, uh, a very uh, nice boutique winery mm. in uh, Clare Valley, Riley's Wines. Unfortunately, we don't see them in the United States very much anymore. But he's a very bright guy, very sensitive guy, and he knows um, he knows the issues. Uh, the Renault Society and, and Dr. Ardle is, uh, is 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 our representative in the south uh, southeast uh, southwest uh, uh, part of the world. Um, is a is a society of medical professionals, primarily, with a interest in better health and better health outcomes and a passion for wine. Uh, these are doctors that understand. Uh, what responsible uh, wine consumption is all about. They understand the art and the science of wine, and it's a very artistic uh, uh, product. I mean, you, you think of it, it's, it's all natural, handcrafted uh, for the most part. Um, it, it really is a piece of art in the bottle, and it has tremendous benefits both from the health standpoint, like I mentioned, and the, uh, the artistic standpoint. It makes life better. Uh, you, you, in the, in terms, you are a doc, a cardiologist, um, can you just talk about an example of a patient that had longevity through moderate red wine consumption? You know, yeah, the anecdotes are difficult, but I, but there is one that uh, there yeah. is one that comes up. Yeah. So there is another cardiologist in town. He's he's an old he's older than I am, still working though. Who had a uh, had a heart attack and wound up having bypass surgery at about sixty years of age. And he had studied in in, in Italy. And had done, uh, had continues to go back to northern Italy where he does a lot of work. And through his experiences in northern Italy, has become a uh, really passionate wine consumer. Um, yet, here's a guy who, at about late 50s, early 60s, had a heart attack and almost died and had multi vessel bypass surgery. Well, that seems like a failure, doesn't it? It's actually not, because his uh, both parents uh, had heart disease at a very early age, in their 40s or so. Uh, I, and and had serious outcomes, so you know genetics is is, is a very important uh, risk factor for yeah. cardiovascular disease and cardi cardiovascular events, and you can't cheat, cheat genetics, although maybe you can keep your blood pressure down, keep your cholesterol down, and have a glass of wine a day, and maybe you won't get that heart disease at age forty or fifty. Maybe you push it back and have it a little bit later on in life, and it won't be as bad. So I, I think that's an example of how potentially. He was able to avoid um, some early uh, damage and early consequences of uh, cardiovascular disease. Now, it's purely an anecdote. I, you know, I can't tell you that that in fact had anything to do with uh, it. But yeah. it is. But I do find it interesting. I tell patients all the time who come to me with high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Their mother had a heart attack at 40. Their father had a heart attack at 40, and they're 39 years old. They better get packing. I mean, they really need. They really need to. Uh, to pay attention to their risk factors, do everything they can to try to avoid the perils that their genetics, unfortunately, is presenting to them. 
What other uh, things does it stave off? Uh, is it uh, helps with diabetes or it helps with uh, dementia or, or Alzheimer? Can you talk a little bit about the other other aside from that heart? Sure. Uh, so th 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 it goes back to the question of how does wine or how does alcohol actually work to improve cardiovascular health or health in general? And there are several proposed mechanisms, most of which have been studied now extensively, so we really understand it. The first thing is that alcohol tends to raise HDL cholesterol. That's high density lipoproteins, the good cholesterol, the happy cholesterol, H, HDL, as opposed to LDL, low, low density, lousy cholesterol. Sad cholesterol. Right. Yeah. So uh, we don't have really good medications to, um, to treat low HDL. And actually there are a lot of patients out there, who, a lot of people out there who have very low HDL levels or are exposed to risk of heart disease because of it. There are some medications, but they're not that robust as far as their effects. Losing weight, exercising is probably the best way of raising HDL. It raises HDL, lowers triglycerides, another bad actor. Uh, but you know, it's hard to get Americans to exercise and lose weight. Yep. <clears throat> and um, well, actually, no. But I mean, that's the whole French paradox. The French are even they don't, they exercise less. Yeah. But you know, it turns out that that regular small consumption of a daily wine or alcohol uh, on a, on a, uh, responsibly has a dramatic effect on HDL cholesterol, raising HDL cholesterol. In fact, there are five different types of HDL cholesterol, and two of them, HDL two and three, I believe it is, <clears throat> have the, the most robust effect from, from alcohol, and those are the most anti-atherosclerotic, anti-inflammatory HDL molecules. So that's, that's an important way of helping to protect blood vessels. The other is the non-alcohol non component of, uh, of wine, which is the polyphenols and the pigments, the procyanidins, the pigments, the color, the stuff that's in the, the, everything else outside of the water and the alcohol <clears throat> that are very, very potent antioxidants, much more potent than, than regular antioxidants we take over the, uh, over the counter. Sure. Uh, and mixed with alcohol, that actually helps absorption of these compounds. It has a very uh, robust neutralizing effect to these free radicals and inflammatory factors that lead not only to blood vessel disease, cardiovascular disease, but also other inflammatory diseases like arthritis, like cancers, and so on and so forth. Now cancer is a, is a mixed bag because alcohol itself increases risk of many cancers, many cancers. Um, but that's all alcoholic beverages lumped together. If you teased out uh, wine compared to spirits or beer, many studies have shown that wine actually doesn't increase the risk of cancer, and the reason for that is most likely the non-alcohol components of the wine that are very potent antineoplastic, anti-inflammatory compounds. Breast cancer is a is sort of on the fence. I think there's a lot of debate over that, and certainly women who have breast cancer really need to, or have had breast cancer, have a family history of breast cancer, really need to be counseled to either drink in moderation or not drink at all. My opinion. No, I mean this is. Fair. I mean, the, um, but to further answer your question, Jake, yeah, yeah. Jake the, uh, the uh, uh, skin diseases, dental disease, arthritis, dementia, which is probably a vascular disease, just like cardiovascular disease, stroke, redu reduction of stroke. My goodness, there was a study of uh, like 80,000 nurses in the, uh, in the, uh, in the nurses follow-up study out of Boston uh, reported several years ago that showed a, a greater than 50% reduction in, sh in sh ischemic stroke risk. In, in drinkers versus non-drinkers. Well, I mean, that is, there are no medications, there are no pills that we have that can reduce the risk of stroke that, that, that much. Uh, now, it can increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke because another effect of alcohol is that it blocks platelets. Platelets are the, um, the small uh, blood cells uh, in the, that circulate in the blood that actually make clots. Right. So if you paralyze those, uh, those uh, clot-forming uh, cells, you potentially have an increased risk of bleeding. Well, heart attacks and strokes are most commonly caused by blood clots. So that's one of the ways that uh, heart attack risk goes down significantly as well as ischemic stroke, but it could increase the risk of bleeding, such as hemorrhagic stroke in the brain, bleeding gastric ulcer, uh, uh, bleeding from the stool, bleeding in the urinary tract, and so on. Again, these are not common complications of, of modest drinking. Um, keep the comments coming in. People are having have a lot have quite a few questions for you that you'll have to answer uh, later on. But um, the Viticulture Summit at UC Davis coming up in in May. Uh, what is on the docket for that? 
Yeah, this is a biannual program that's sponsored by the Renault Society and the Desert Heart Foundation. This year, co-sponsored by the Rob Mandabi Institute for uh, Wine and Food Science at UC Davis. This is the quintessential uh, academic program uh, where all the major clinical and bench science researchers in wine, health, uh, and so on, epidemiologists, will converge <clears throat> in, at Davis and uh, present all the latest data on wine and health issues. Now, it's a, there's a robust social program also. We have several uh, very uh, well-known winemakers that will be speaking at the meetings. Uh, Tim Mondavi, one of the sons of uh, the sons of Robert Mondavi. Really, not not Michael. Not Michael. It'll be Tim Tim Mondavi. Tim Mondavi, I love it. And uh, Larry Turley. Larry Turley is a, is a uh, is a cult Zinfandel producer for the most part, Rhone Rhone wine type producer up in up in Napa. Uh, Larry Turley is well known. Is uh, everybody who drinks uh, Napa wines know the name Turley. His sister Helen Turley is a famous winemaker also. But Larry is the Zinfandel king in. Uh, in Napa. He also happens to be a retired uh, ER doctor, so it's Larry Turley, MD, that will be presenting uh, sort of the history and the culture of uh, Napa Zinfandel uh, there. The uh, program will have a piece sponsored by Zinfandel advocates uh, and producers uh, 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 that will present uh, tastings of all the, uh, the, the, the Zinfandels that the, of the area as well. So. It is a very enjoyable and very informative program on the academics of wine and health, and a very, um, a very enjoyable uh, 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 hospitality program. Oh, I mean, uh, how, how can people find uh, information about it? Yeah, so the, the the website for the program is www.winesummit.org. Wine Winesummit.org. Wine I'm I'm hoping to get up there to cover it. I, you know, I want to do a little fast round robin with you. Just free associate. Uh, in a few words, I'm going to tell you somebody's name, and you just tell me what comes to your mind. Kurt Ellison, Dr. Kurt Ellison. Yeah, Kurt Ellison is the senior most uh, uh, guy in this in this uh, in this uh, story at this point. He uh, he and uh, Serge Renault uh, were the ones that appeared on 60 Minutes back in the early 90s and sort of broke the story that um, that wine and uh, and uh, regular wine uh, consumption. Had a dramatic effect on cardiovascular disease and uh, and cardiac survival. Uh, the, uh, the, the 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 whole concept of the French paradox, as you as you know, you know the French the French are uh, eat uh, these these diets that are high in fat, sauces, uh, cheeses, so on and so forth. Fatty food. pudding. Uh, yeah. what, what we would we would look at the diet and say this is very heart unhealthy. Yeah. Yet their risk of cardiovascular disease tends to be very very low. Uh, you know, then there have been several several criticisms as well. You know, the French doctors don't know how to diagnose heart disease. You know, farmers in the field, he clutches his chest, drops dead, and they say, ah, oh, he died of cancer. <laughs> well, you know, it turns out that's not the case. Okay, yeah. That's not the case. Uh, and uh, Renault and, and Ellison were able to um, present Renault's data from uh, from France, showing that when they factored in the effect of red wine uh, and, and, and benefits, basically it corrected the the if you took that out basically the French then had an expected high risk of cardiovascular disease and cardiac death so there's a paradox they they poorly they uh, uh, smoke a lot of cigarettes smoke a lot of cigarettes and they uh, they tend to have a low risk of heart disease well you take the wine out and now they do have a high risk of heart disease so that was the paradox it was it proved very clearly that uh, the wine was was it was the reason that the French enjoyed uh, better cardiovascular health. And for himself, but he sort of discovered Renault uh, in doing that. He worked with Renault on other uh, uh, projects. And he and uh, Renault uh, uh, were put together with uh, Morley Safer from 60 Minutes and um, made that dramatic. Yeah, I think we need, a, we need, a, we need a, a, rev a new iteration of that with you and some of the other cats to talk about some of the new data. They, they, they did a lot of research with rats. That's how they got the the data yeah that's um uh anthony another cardiologist winemaker anthony truchard so tony truchard is uh is a good friend of mine and joanne as well joanne is his wife uh tony's a great uh, story because he was a very successful internist in uh, reno nevada uh comes from a family in the south texas where uh they did grow grapes down there and still do um and Tony uh, uh, was in Reno, and, uh, and which was close to Napa, and uh, made trips to Napa Valley, and had the uh, foresight 
to make a good investment in some pretty prime real estate in the Carneros region and uh, planted beautiful uh, vineyards. Most of his wines, I believe, in, in, the, in the front end was, were sold to other producers, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately decided to make his own wine, his own brand, and, um, and makes marvelous wines. Uh, Tony is uh, getting up in age, but his uh, son, Anthony Jr., is, uh, is now taking over. He's got his own kind of work. wine going on. He has his own little boutique uh, wine production as well. And Joanne is the queen of hospitality for Napa Valley. I've been there. It's beautiful. I mean, uh, and then uh, one more cat is uh, Bob Bialy. So, Bob Bialy also is a good friend, and I, I met him initially on his back porch with his dad, Aldo. Uh, really, Aldo, really, as a consumer, uh, you know, I'm uh, as you as you know. I mean, I'm, I enjoy Zinfandels tremendously, and and Bob was was uh, was as a young was a young Zinfandel producer. Uh, I think his interest in Zinfandels probably stemmed from his dad, who's Piedmontese. Uh, originally, and um, hmm. sort of was exposed to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to that uh, grape, the uh, or at least the Primitivo grape from southern Italy, some somewhere along the lines, and became a uh, uh, a cult producer of, of, of Zinfandels from many different vineyards in uh, Napa Valley. Probably the best vineyard, of course, was in his backyard, and that's Aldo's Vineyard. Uh, Bob is a, Bob and his, his partner Dave Pramick, both the owners of uh, Robert Bialy Vineyards, are. Um, have been sponsors of uh, the, the Renault Society Desert Heart Foundation uh, academic events since the, its inception in 2001. So we, I have a lot of respect uh, for their um, commitment yeah. to, uh, to the industry, uh, to seeing that their products are, are special and, uh, and enjoyable by everybody who, who purchases them, but also seeing that there's responsibility, understanding that there's responsibility, and that they're they're producing something that actually has some health benefits. Dr. Ted, before I let you go, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, uh, from all the interviews that I did last year uh, on Facebook Live, Mondavi and Hendry and Bialy and, and all the radio interviews, um, did you learn anything from them? Um, you can say no. Yes. I mean, you could say well, it brought I, a smile to you. You, you laughed. Know, well, you know? they, they all brought a smile to my yeah. face because these are all, these are all, well, most of them are, are, are friends of mine. But, yeah. you know, I, I really, I, I enjoy listening to these people. These are all pioneers in, in the field of winemaking and the field of health and, uh, and such. And, of course, you learn something every time you listen to them. Um, so, yeah, I find, I found them very enjoyable. Probably learned something, can't recall, right up off the bat. Right. Uh, but um, you always learn something by... Uh, oh, ultimately, by Bob, ultimately, Bobby Ali did not want to come out of his office, but they got him out, and once they did, he, I yeah, couldn't Bob's get Bob's a... That's interesting. Bob's a quiet guy. Dave is... Dave is I was able to get... I was able to extract the information, and... Uh, yeah. It's a... You know, these are, these are all very interesting people. Uh, I'll say that in general. I mean, yeah. white people in general are very interesting people. Absolutely. They really embrace culture. They embrace life. They embrace lifestyle. They're all about sitting back with a good glass of wine, nice weather, sitting on the back porch like Bob always talks about, uh, like I've done with Tony Chouchard and Tony and Joanne at his uh, vineyard, sitting in their gazebo uh, with a glass of wine looking out over the vineyards. A good friend of mine who passed away several years ago, Alta Lormier, was a, was a pediatric surgeon in San Francisco. Same thing, he had a beautiful house up in Alexander Valley, which is the northern part of Sonoma, uh, and he had a beautiful vineyard, the Lormier Vineyards, that is still going. He doesn't own it, his family doesn't own it anymore but still carries his historic name. And um, these guys know something about life that most people don't. Uh, and, this, and you get a glimpse of it, you know, when you travel through Europe and, and so on, other wine regions. It's very, very, um, it's very uh, universal. Uh, these people are, uh, are focused on, 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 on better lives, on, on, on better lifestyle. That's sort of how I got interested in wine in the, in the beginning. It wasn't really an academic pursuit for me. It was my first trip to Europe in the early 1980s after I got out of medical school. Mm. And you can't go to Europe and you can't go to France and travel without bumping into wine people, wine wineries, vineyards, and you can't help but being impressed by the type of lifestyle that's led in these uh, you know, small villages, family homes, and so on and so forth. My academic interest in wine came much later, actually, about 10, 15 years later, when I met a, uh, as you would say, a cat, a, a fellow in... Uh, yeah, one a, of the cats. A, a, a brilliant uh, cardiologist in, uh, in, uh, in London, at the University of London, uh, 
is the chair of the, uh, the cardiothoracic section at, Great, uh, section at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, uh, John Deanfield, who is the uh, quintessential researcher. Is he still with us? John is still uh, very much with us, yeah. Oh, that's uh, great. John, John, is, John, was the, John really developed uh, uh, the, the way of studying blood vessels that we've never experienced before uh, and studying them in li living, pa living patients, living people. And uh, I took some of my staff from Tucson out to, to London. We, we spent some time with John and his technicians and learned how to study the, uh, the, um, the blood vessels uh, in vivo, in living uh, patients. And John happened to be a, a fairly interesting wine connoisseur as well and had a couple of great bottles at his house at, at uh, Regent Park. And he and I collaborated on some studies looking at uh, blood vessel physiology and, um, and uh, wine consumption. So, um, uh, but that was your—that was where the academic interest. Yeah, that was where my academic interest is, and I've invited John to all of these meetings, similar to the ones we have we're having in, in Davis coming up. He's been at a couple of these meetings in the past. These are these meetings have been every other year since two thousand one, uh, and John has been an active participant, uh, great contributor, continues to be a leader in the cardiovascular community in many many directions. One final question: Not that you are uh, a winemaker, but what would be your advice to younger startup winemakers who actually want to the thing the common golden thread between Trouchard, Bialy, Jerry Seps, all these guys is that the only place they feel comfortable is in the fields. They work tight well, maybe Anthony's getting a little bit older, but they work so hard. And you're getting a lot of people that come into Napa that are buying land. They're they're not even there. They're outsourcing the work. And so it's just there's still plenty of family wineries, but if there's a startup, what's your what's your quick advice for them? Well, the quick advice is don't do it for the money. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a rule. There's sort of a rule in in, uh, in wine in, in wine making. If you want to make a small fortune in, in in the wine industry, you have to start off with a large fortune. Uh, right. I, I actually I have, love that. It's a great line. Yeah, I've actually I actually have had the experience. Uh, you know, myself and two other doctors started a, a, a vineyard out in Cochise County, which is. Uh, just southwest of Tucson, southeast of Tucson, and invested a, a good bit of money into into planting vines and, and some equipment, so on and so forth. And of course, it was disastrous. I mean, making wine in Arizona, it's not impossible, but some people do. Sure. But it is difficult when you have three doctors who have full time jobs and such. And so uh, we could have bought a lot of great Bialy, Trouchard, uh, Mondavi uh, wines uh, for that for the money that we, we threw into that. And it's a lot of hard work, you know. It, 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 yeah, a lot of people who make money elsewhere, the people who are buying vineyard land now in, in Napa, I think, are are people who made their money elsewhere, right. and they're doing it as a, as a hobby, and that's right. marvelous. There's nothing, nothing better than seeing your own name on a, on a label. I think it's a great feeling. You know, I have uh, two two vines I snuck out of uh, Cochise County and put put in my backyard here in Tucson. Actually, four vines. Only two of them survived, though. Arizona is a tough place to grow things. Um, and my son and I, who's 16 years old now, sort of pick these two these two vines and crush by hand and such, and make uh, wine every year. Um, and I'll tell you, just picking two two vines and doing the work on, for just for two vines to make about you know three to five gallons. I mean, these are very, fairly productive vines. It's a lot of work, and it makes a mess out of the house. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult. So, well, trust I, getting. I think that, I yeah. think I'm done, and I would strongly suggest that if you're thinking about doing this, you reconsider and try to focus on finding people who have that passion that you have, who really have that full-time ability. Let me just turn that yeah, off. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, really have that full-time ability to, uh, to really put their passion into the bottle. And, you know, the, the Renault Society, uh, fortunately, has found some people like that. I, I've got a bottle right here yeah, what's that? that, I, that I, I brought to show you. This is a bottle that was made for the Renault Society. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, this was bottled probably bottled in 2005, 2006, but it's a 2003, uh, released 2005, 2006, 2003 vineyard of uh, vintage of a wine from Bordeaux. And it's made by the Menain family in Bayshac. It's on the right bank of, um, of Bordeaux. And it's uh, everything you could possibly want to see in a winemaking family. Everybody from the grandfather, the father, the son, the dogs, they're all in the vineyards. Uh, uh, they eat in the vineyards, they come back, they sweat, they work, they shower, they go back and do it again. I mean, it's a, and they're, uh, it's all small, done by hand, 
and I had the, the great fortune of bumping into them years ago, uh, being the first American ever to set foot in their winery. Wow. And when it came time to the Renault Society to produce a, uh, its own wine, there was no choice but to go to the Menain family and say, look, this is something uh, that we want you to produce uh, for our health, a Lotro Sante. Uh, and, uh, and they've Lotre done Sante. it. And they've done it. It's a great bottle. Um, we uh, People want samples. They're asking for samples. At, uh, <laughs> yeah. So there no, it, it's a limited quantity, trust me. Uh, right. But... Um, and it's, it, we can't sell it, of course, because we know we don't have licensing for sale. But, we, but at the Renault Society events, we had a, a, a dinner at the Castello di Amorosa in, uh, in Calisoga in December. We served this, oh, just, this past, place. just this past December. We served it, and it held up beautifully. So, you know, this is a good, good Bordeaux that it will hold up for many, many years to come. I will tell you that another release of Renault Society wine will be uh, presented at the Davis program. So we will have a, a, a second wine from the Society that our, hopefully our society members will be able to take a bottle home uh, from the program. I'll tell you what, I'll give this, uh, this bottle's for you, Jake. Uh, you no, take it and you, you enjoy it. I think you will. It's no, really, I can't. I mean, I can't wait. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome bottle of wine. Dr. Ted Goldfinger, thank you for your leadership, education, and inspiration. And uh, it's been an honor to have you on the program. Thanks, Jake. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. See you later.